what issues do you care about the most? What are the issues that, that are going to keep you up at night if you, you know, 20 years from now, feel like you didn't do something to address them? Hmm. Right? And so for a lot of people, climate change is a big one, but another one is race relations, you know, uh, or economic gaps and economic opportunities. So, you know, I think the first thing is just worry about them, do nothing. Maybe the next best is to worry about them, give some money to them, but not act in your career. And I think that the, <laughs> uh -huh. the best way to do it is to say, I care enough about these issues. I'm going to invest my professional efforts, meaning my career, in addressing them. Welcome to the CEO Sessions, hosted by Ben Fanning. And here's Ben. Hey there, welcome to today's show. I've got a special episode today in store for you with Seth Goldman. Seth is founder of Eat the Change, a platform to inform and empower consumers to make dietary choices aligned with their concerns around climate and health. And Seth is also the co-founder of Plant Burger, Honest Tea, and chair of the board of Beyond Meat. And by the way, Honest Tea and Beyond Meat both have a place on our home and they are delicious. <laughs> he has been widely recognized for his entrepreneurial success and impact, including Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year in Greater Washington, the Washington, D.C. Business Hall of Fame, Beverage Industry Magazine's Executive of the Year, Beverage World's Number One Disruptor, and Partnership for a Healthier America's CEO of the Year. Yeah, lots of recognition there. He is a graduate of Harvard College and Yale School of Management and is a Henry Crown Fellow of the Aspen Institute. Seth and his co-founder Barry Nailbluff are the authors, along with the graphic artist Sun Young Choi, of the New York Times best-selling comment book. That's right, I said comment book, and we get into that into this interview. Best-selling comment book, Mission in a Bottle. We're going to be covering in today's show the first question you should ask when you find yourself at a career crossroads why Seth believes the commercial sector is a terrific place to make a big social impact. We spent a lot of time on that at the beginning. I think you're really going to enjoy that. And then we get into how learning to maximize your optionality is key for success. I wasn't really familiar with the term optionality, but it sounds a lot like the word freedom. And believe me, you're going to get a lot out of that piece. Seth's personal strategy for overcoming jet lag. It's a really practical strategy why he decided to write his business book as a graphic novel, AKA comic book. You're going to get a kick out of that story. I have actually read this graphic novel and sped right through it. It is terrific. Then we'll get into two rules for dealing with stress. The story, the very engaging story behind why he became vegetarian, then vegan and the health benefits that he's received so far from that, making that change your most valuable personal resource, how to instill the entrepreneurial mindset in every employee, the productive way to bring a problem to your boss, and then what it's like to be part of one of the most successful IPOs in history. Enjoy the show. Hey, Seth, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. <laughs> Fun to be with you. Yeah. Thanks for being on with me today. This is going to be a lot of fun. Um, one of the things that really uh, came up in my research so I wanted to ask you about is you seem like someone who is, is an expert in weaving together what they're passionate about into your personal and professional life. And we'll get into what those are, but I want to ask you right out of the gate, uh, what's your advice for others who maybe they have a passion um, or they've or maybe it's their family life, and they can't quite seem to make that connection between bringing it all together into a business and career. What advice do you have for them? You know, I, 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 it sounds kind of simple and maybe obvious, but it really is just follow what you really care about. You know, and and so I think often people think, well, what I care about, they think it's money, but it, it's it's not. What is money? It's maybe money gives you more time to spend with your family or more time to pursue the causes you care about. Uh, mm -hmm. And instead, go right to those causes. And and to me, money is a, a byproduct. You know, maybe it comes, maybe it doesn't. But as long as you're doing things you care about, and 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 allocating your time, you know, in a way that that feels meaningful, that's the right way to go. And so uh, I've I've been very fortunate that these issues that I care about. Um, you know, I, I looked at 
issues and thought about how best to address them. And some of these issues are addressed by nonprofits, but there was also an mm-hmm. opportunity to address these same issues in the marketplace. And uh, for me, I actually, and I have worked in the nonprofit arena and, and have enjoyed some yeah. of my work there, but I have also found that uh, the marketplace gives you the chance to be more creative and it's definitely more dynamic because you <laughs> have to respond to the consumer. Uh, and then the, and, and um, so for me, I have really enjoyed that nexus between where values and impact and uh, scaling a business, an enterprise connect. Yeah. Th- so that reminds me of a quote that I read and, and correct this quote if it's not correct, but private enterprise could promote the pub, the, the public good is, is, sure. the, is the, is the quote I've seen. Do what, what examples did you draw on early on for you to yeah. believe this was possible? Because you started and just, just to give the audience a little snapshot, you were pretty hardcore into the, the government world, the nonprofit world, right? right. As, as I corrected you, as you, after you came out of Harvard, you taught in Russia and China. You worked right. on the Michael Dukakis campaign. You worked for right. Lloyd Benson, AmeriCorps, Department of State. And then you got into Calvert Investments, right? But you had a right. string of nonprofit government work before right. you sort of made that mental shift. Yeah. What was it? Well, I, I enjoyed that work. And by the way, you know, I don't think it wasn't the mental shift. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to start not thinking about the public, it was really just a shift in sectors. And I really brought mm-hmm. that same mindset around addressing public issues, public, you know, benefiting the public good, but just doing it through the private sector. And so yes. I really feel like I'm still wearing that hat. You know, what we did, because uh, I was part of AmeriCorps before it was AmeriCorps, when it was just getting started, and, and it's national service. And so I do feel the businesses I've launched have played a role. You know, we're trying to make the American population healthier. We're trying to create a more sustainable mm-hmm. environmental system. We're trying to um, shift agriculture towards and, and diets towards more plant-based, which I think are better for the planet, better for, for humans and better for <laughs> animals too. And, and better for sort of the overall planet sustainability. Mm-hmm. These are things that, as you know, there's a lot of nonprofits working on these very same issues. Uh, and as much as, um, we need those um, nonprofits. I think there's also a role for for-profit enterprise to play. So, what was it where you came out of school and you decided instead of going into the commercial sector, you were yeah. going to head down this other road? Yeah, I was. A, I was a little bit of a political um, wonk. I, I, you know, I majored in government. As you know, I worked on campaigns. Mm-hmm. For me, I thought the public sector and politics was the most direct way to impact um, public good. And, and okay. it's certainly there is a role for that, no question. Mm-hmm. But but what I also saw was that a lot of, at least at the federal level, government um, can be a lot of posturing, uh, a lot of talk and less action and, and, a, and, and a bit of a disconnect between the people you're serving and the work you do. And so for me, um, as I got exposed to what the private sector can be, I realized okay. there was a chance to directly go after these issues, you know, so, so I don't think, for example, if we're trying to make Americans healthy, there's some things the government can do, but not, I don't think it's the government's role to, to sort of, um, sort of monitor and, and regulate people's diets. I do think there's an opportunity though for companies to commercialize products that ha- that if they can taste delicious and have a better health impact, then that's something, yeah. you know, private enterprise can do and should do. It's hard, by the way. It's not because you make a, <laughs> you make a healthy product yeah. doesn't mean consumers adopt it right away. So um, I, that's, that takes some, some creativity and it takes some hard work for sure and some persistence. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so um, I saw that as a way to, to I- address the issues. And frankly, you know, uh, <laughs> during the time I've been doing it, politics has gotten less and less appealing because I see what's going on there. And I, I see mm-hmm. a lot of the same not just now, it's not just posturing talk. There's just a lot of negativity. Uh, uh, and, and I will say, you know, my experience with business has been surprisingly uplifting and positive. I just don't feel like I, there's not a negative. I don't feel negative vibes. Uh, even when we're competing against other companies, um, I just think about what we're trying to do. And, and we get such wonderful reinforcement from our consumers who appreciate what we're doing and from our, from our, um, our stakeholders, whether it's you know, tea workers in China or, um, mm-hmm. you know, pea, pea growers here in the United States. Um, so to me, there's, we get to feel that impact directly. And, and that's also really gratifying. What advice do you have people that are maybe coming out of college or maybe even their mid-career 
And they're like, man, I've been in the commercial sector. I'm thinking about nonprofit in the, in the government mm-hmm. world or maybe vice versa. Yeah. What kinds of questions should they be thinking about when they're making that decision? Yeah. I think it really is what issues do you care about the most? What are the issues that, that are going to keep you up at night if you, you know, 20 years from now feel like you didn't do something to address them? Hmm. Right? And so for a lot of people, climate change is a big one, but another one is race relations, you know, uh, or economic gaps and economic opportunity. So, you know, I think the first thing is just to worry about them, do nothing. Maybe the next best is to worry about them, give some money to them, but not act in your career. And I think that the, <laughs> uh-huh. the best way to do it is to say, I care enough about these issues. I'm going to invest my professional efforts, meaning my career, in addressing them. And so look, there's, that's, that's, a, that's a very different uh, way to approach those issues mm-hmm. um, because um, maybe it means giving up a comfortable job or a comfortable position or a comfortable career track. But I, I, I'm obviously those are, you know, I've chosen to um, make that decision. And for me, it, it's certainly been gratifying. And, and look, there's no guarantee, even as we launch a new business here, uh, that it's going to work out. But I'll never regret taking the risk to try to address them. Mm. You know, um, so yeah. I think success is not guaranteed. Uh, but you know, the benefits of going after something you care about, that's, that's a, that's a guaranteed benefit, even if it doesn't work out. Yeah. That is, that is really twist. uh, That is really flipping how most people approach their career. I think they're thinking about their long-term prospects, promotion path, the financial stability, you know, things of that nature, starting with what you really care about and what issues you're you're most passionate about and then start and building upon that is a different way to look at it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you know, one of the keys, so one of the keys, especially to talking to people early on in their careers, one of the keys then is to make sure you have that flexibility. So for our family, um, we we were very conscious to live on a very lean budget. You know, during the first, mm-hmm. I always say the first 10 years of honesty were as a nonprofit, not because we were a 501c3, but because we had no profits. <laughs> and so <laughs> there you go. As, okay. a, as a result, you know, I, pay, I was, I drew a very um, low salary uh, relative to sort of what I had been making in the investment world. And the only yep. reason I could afford that is because we got used, we were already at a place where we, you know, we didn't have cable TV. We didn't, we weren't taking fancy <laughs> vacations. We were, you know, we, we, had our kids actually, they were all living in the same uh, room. Oh. That part of that was by choice, but you know. So, so the so, step back you took after you left Calvary, you were you were already li- l- learning. Yeah, the it wasn't a step back. It was how we were, yeah, exactly. No. We were already living that way, so we yeah. knew. And it, did, you know, I mean, we didn't have a high burn rate, right? And it made it easier for me to do those things. But one challenge is people go to business school. Maybe they get some signing bonus after work and then they start spending money and all of a sudden they're like, well, I, you know, I got a big nut to cover every uh, month and I can't, yeah. I, so you're already trapped before you even start to really make career path decisions. Wow. Yeah. So if you are making some sacrifices early on, or maybe you're not really sure what career path you're going to, you're going to invest yourself in long term, live lean yeah. while you're, before yeah. you make that decision in case you yeah. do need to cut back. Yeah. So it's interesting yeah. in a business, you always talk about optionality. You want to maximize your optionality. You want to make sure you don't make decisions that cut off future choices. And that could be ownership choices or route to market or, or, you know, um, how you, how you grow. And yeah. as much as we value that in business, people often don't think about it in their personal lives. And so I wow. encourage people to preserve yeah. optionality and maintain optionality to make sure you have, you know, for example, if you think you're going to enter a career path where there's, you have to relocate a lot, don't go, you know, invest in a house <laughs> with a big yeah. mortgage and you, that where the, if the market's tight and you can't get out of it, you know, just think, think of, about how yeah. you optimize your optionality. Yeah, I like that word optionality. It reminds me of the word freedom. <laughs> yeah, you can be, <laughs> that's right. By, by maintaining optionality, yeah. You keep your options open, you have more yeah. freedom versus locking yourself in so early with a big with with big debt or something along those right. lines and you can't right. do that. Now, you mentioned honesty, which yeah. is fantastic. So let's let's Thank dive you. into your book because sure. this book is called Mission in a Bottle and it is it is I was I was just explaining <laughs> to Seth before this. It may have been one of the fastest business books I've gotten through, and yet it does have 200, almost 300 pages in it. And you might be asking, well, why is that? And it's a graphic novel. 
So <laughs> Seth, why did you write your business book as a graphic novel? Yeah. Well, I think the <laughs> key part of it is it was a book you got through, you finished, right? And a lot of business yes. books, I was, so after we sold Honest Tea to Coca-Cola in 2011, I was thinking about how do we share this story? And I was reading a bunch of different business books, trying to see if I could sort of figure out what was working, what wasn't working. And the fact was, none of them was working. I just found them all, like I could read the first few chapters and then I just put it down. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And at, at the same time that I was going through that process, my oldest son um, was he, in his senior year of high school and he had gotten into Colorado College. And so he was um, not so motivated to study. He was reading a lot of comic books. And my job was to try to keep him on task. And, and here I was trying to read these business books. And I'm like, oh, this one's boring. And he'd say, well, look at this comic book. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so your son ingress. corrupted you. Great. Oh, totally, Good job. <laughs> totally. Yeah, exactly. And so I realized the comic book was a really hmm. um, powerful way to tell a story, not just to people you know who might be business thinkers, but to other people who may not think of themselves as a business thinker. I mean, it's hard. Uh, a comic book is so much less intimidating, right? If I give you, here's a 300 page all textbook, I want you to read about a business. Eh, I don't know. Here's a comic book. It's about a business, but it's a comic book. Well, okay, that's that makes it a lot more fun. And and we realized, of course, that our story and our business itself had a lot of visual elements that were best told in hmm. you know graphic form. So we had a lot of fun with it, and and got a lot of I had a lot of um, fun as a response too, because it actually became one of the, uh, of the when we released it in 2013, it was a top selling co- you know graphic novel of, of you know uh, <laughs> for for a while, and that was yes, yeah, so you a niche in a category to, too, yeah, that, yeah. We and we wanted to make the story accessible to people who weren't the traditional business book readers. And I think we did that, and yeah. we also wanted it to be something that could ever be evergreen, where people thinking about launching a business could read it and you know have it speak to them, and, and we've certainly heard that too. Yeah, I think that really speaks to the heart of the book. It's a story that a lot of people can relate to, even if you're not really, it, you're, you're not planning to launch your own business. Right. It, it has a business spin to it, but it's also about, it's my, my sense is about finding your way as yeah. leaders and bringing this, yeah. it's not just about tea. I mean, the tea is no, an expression sure. of, of who you are and the impact you want to make in the world. I think the book gets right. that across. No, that's for sure. And we also, as, as you know, tell the personal story as well. I mean, our family, you know, both Barry, yeah. my co-founder and, and my family went on quite a journey during those first 10 years and uh, health issues and other issues that arose. And, yeah. and so, you know, that's all part of it. You can't, I don't think you can separate a business experience. When, when you're an entrepreneur, you can't sort of say, okay, well, here's a story about a business. Here's a story about a family. And it, it's all enmeshed together. Well, m- talk about that day. One of the one of the parts of the book that I liked was that day where you were running in Central Park. Yeah, and yeah. you had kind of flirted with this tea idea, yeah. and th- years before, right? But some, what what was it about that aha moment that that yeah. made you change direction there? For sure. So when I was at the Yale School of Management, I had done this case study with my co-founder Barry. Of course, he wasn't my co-founder at the time. At the time, he was my professor. Uh, and it was about the beverage industry. And we had agreed that there was something missing in the in the beverage world. There was mm-hmm. all these sweet drinks and all these watery drinks, but nothing with just a little bit of sweetness. And we kind of left it at that, at that. I mean, Barry had said, oh, let's do some focus groups. But I was, you know, in my second year of business school and I had to find a job. So I didn't do anything about it. But after um, giving some investment presentations in New York, I went for a run in Central Park. And after the run, I was thirsty and I, I went to a beverage cooler. Uh, and I was with a friend of mine from, from college. And I said, look, there's there's nothing here to drink. And he said, well, what do you mean? There's dozens, even hundreds of options. I said, yeah, but they're all the same. And that was when I said, you know, I've, hmm. I've kind of had that entrepreneurial edge. I was just looking for the right idea. This might be the idea. And I reached back out to Barry and I said, you, you remember that case study where we talked about this? I think I'm ready to finally do something about it. And Barry said, not only do I remember it, but um, I've been thinking about it too. And Barry had just come back from India where he'd been doing a case study of the tea industry. And as part of that, he had come up with the name Honest Tea. And that for me, kind of like, oh, you know, that was sort of like the, that lightning moment. Okay, that connects all the dots. That's a way to, to create a brand yes. that's authentic and has a commitment to social responsibility, but also, you know, um, also clearly says what it is. And yes. so um, I said, all right, let's go. And, and from there, uh, I, 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 the next few months, we started developing samples of tea emailing back and forth ideas and thinking about label design and by the that that run happened in september of 1997 and 
by the uh, December of 1997, I was ready to you know, leave my investment job and wow. head off into the wilderness. <laughs> yeah. So how did you know it was time to make the leap? Because you were brewing well, tea. It, yeah. You were doing your yeah. tea on the side. And exactly. Then, and then yeah, you pull things. the ripcord or whatever. <laughs> a few things. Well, a few things. It is, it is like pulling a ripcord. Except you don't know if the parachute's going to come out. So. <laughs> You're hoping. <laughs> You've already. It's like jumping off the plane, and and if the parachute comes out, that's <laughs> the good news. But um, so I um I had already been thinking about entrepreneurial enterprises and what could I launch that I could be excited about, and I didn't. I, I was just looking for the right idea. So so I was already mentally ready for that. Um, and then two things happened. One was um kind of out of nowhere an investment my father had made in my name back in 1971. Um, they had a, it was a, a tech company. They had a management buyout and I was presented with a check for $50,000. Like, well, that's my, uh, I mean, that doesn't happen. I mean, it, it did happen randomly, but uh, there was not a coincidence. Like that's my startup uh -huh. capital. Okay. I can, wow, okay. That means yeah, I, can, yeah. I can basically launch a business and, you know, uh, and, and by the way, you know, what was my salary that first year? $50,000. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. um, uh -huh. And uh, so that told me they were okay. There, there's less financial risk if I do this. Um, and then I, um, I remember when I was getting ready to go in to resign from my work at Calvert, the investment company where I was. I I called Barry just to get a little last boost of confidence. I said, okay, I'm I'm going to go resign from you know this business. Um, and uh, you know my wife and I had just had our third son, and so I was sort of going to Barry saying, now we never made this tea in anywhere but our kitchen, but you think we can make it? And and uh, and Barry was like, well, I'm pretty sure we can, uh, <laughs> and which wasn't exactly what I was. He says, he says, but maybe if you go to Calvert and say, you know, I think I can just, I'd like to take a sabbatical. I bet you they'd let you do that. Mm. And I said, I appreciate that, but if I'm going to launch it, I got to go all in. You know, it, it is like jumping out of the plane. You, you, there's no, you, you don't get a little uh, lifeline that, that keeps you there. So um, I, you know, I went in and said, I'm, I'm, I've got to go try this, give this a try. Wow. So as the book goes on from, from that point, you just, and you said earlier, the lean years yeah. and, and the book, I mean, you don't really pull any punches there in terms of <laughs> how stressful it was. It was. Uh, what yeah. were, what are some strategies maybe use then or that you learn in your career uh, that you use now that you yeah. find helpful to like deal with burnout and stress yeah. and things of that well, nature? So it's interesting, Ben, because here I am starting a new enterprise, you know, uh, so mm -hmm. basically 22 years later. And, and yes, there's still stresses, but I will say I, I'm, I've got a much better way to deal with those than I did then. I mean, I think partially because, you know, I have a little more of a financial cushion than I did when I started. Um, but it really wasn't about that. It's really just a more experience. Okay. Yeah. Look, there's going to be stress here. We've got deadlines. We've got cost of goods that are out of whack. You know, we've got challenging situations with vendors uh, and how do we sort of work those out? Um, the, the, for me, the strategies I've been at it long enough. Now I know, you know, one thing is uh, sort of one of my law, I've got to exercise every day. You know, I can't exercise. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've got what type to be of exercise. To Are you more of a cardio person or um, where, I am? Yeah. So or? today, today was a little unusual because I actually, um, I just flew back from California. So I got to get a um, just to work out the jet lag. So I, I got up this morning and biked 25 miles through Rock Creek Park. And then I came home and, and then swam uh, about 1500 meters in the pool, um, public pool down the street. So that was, you know, that, that's certainly wow. more than I would normally do. But like for me, <laughs> really getting off the, working off the jet lag. Yeah. So you're not, the jet you're lag. not one of these people who's feeling jet lag. I'm going to sleep a little bit extra today. Yeah. You fight the jet lag with cardio. That's it. That's it. And it, it also means I keep out uh, any stress. So um, one, of my, one of my rules with the exercise, I've got to be able to make sure some of it is outdoors. And I'm fortunate today, both you know, workouts were outside. Um, and then I've got to be able to end without feeling stress. Um, and mm -hmm. and uh, you know, that's for me, that really is important. And, and you know, I, I pack a lot of benefits into that workout. I mean, part of it is stress. Part of it is you know, I'm doing, a, a, um, I have enough time just in my own mind without other distractions, no phone calls, no texts. I can think things out. I can work out issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's really critical. Um, and I, I, so for me, that, that is definitely works. The other one is uh, making sure I have enough time interacting with people not connected to the business. Uh, so for me, that's uh. usually my wife 
uh, in my family. Okay. Um, and just being able to talk about other things. Sometimes bring, I, sometimes I'll talk about work issues uh, with them, but often I just need to be able to talk uh, different things to get my mind off it. You know, mm-hmm. it's so easy when you are starting up a business to have it consume you. And yes. every everything you I think about, it, every yes. yeah, every every interaction is no. all about it, and and then you just get in a swirl. And when it's bad, you get swirled up, and when it's good, you get caught up in it, and and you can forget things too. So I've got to maintain that balance, uh, and that doesn't mean like there's days we have twenty hour days, or you know, we'll, I'll spend you know sort of a blitz day a product for doing a production run, you know, and we're driving thirteen hours to a production facility, and then we're staying up all night doing it. I I yeah. get that, that's part of it, but on a over time, it has to average out, and I have so to. Be able it, to so get it that sounds out. like it's it's not as much for you about rest as it's more about refocusing on something different or shifting your yeah, focus balance. to exercise it's or to conversation. Balance. Yeah, yeah, some sense of balance, some sense of perspective too. The other thing I get from being out in nature is you just have this chance to um, sort of recognize your your place on the earth. So I was, as I said, out in California earlier this week, and. Mm-hmm. I, I went for runs um, down in the beach and, you know, you're near the ocean. I actually, yesterday I was swimming in the ocean um, and, mm. <laughs> and it was just big and powerful. And, oh, and yeah. uh, there's a lot of uh, things much more powerful than, than I am. And, and uh, you know, sort of getting hit around by the waves. And that's a little humbling. And, and it's so, just useful to keep your, keep a sense of perspective. Yeah. Physical, a, a physical reminder <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> with yeah. giant waves. Yeah. No, that, yeah. I, I can see that. I can see that. That's, that's, that's good stuff. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you too was a little bit, it seems like some instances in the book, a little bit of luck and, and where luck might've come in. And uh, two people come to mind, Barack Obama and Oprah Winfrey. Yeah. Uh, what, was the, what was the role that they had in your, in your adventure at, at yeah. Honest T? There were a lot of really just wonderful coincidences where People were drawn to the product, found it. Um, you know, we told in this book we mentioned those two, um, but there was there were notable others. And um, for us, it was just I, I think it was the right karma. We put the right mm. effort into the brand, the right intention into the brand, and 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 uh, and part of what we the, the meaning of mission in a bottle is when someone picks up that bottle, hopefully they get some of that mission through it, either through the label message, through the drink itself, through the taste of the drink through the certifications of fair trade and organic. And so I do think, you know, people took an extraordinary interest in what we were doing more than they might normally, if it was just sort of a, a neutral drink. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it was fun to have there. Now, neither of them were paid endorsers. We didn't, we actually didn't have any real <laughs> paid endorsers, but they were folks who liked the product and, and, you know, we're happy, you know, Oprah mentions it quite prominently in her magazine and Obama had, you know, multiple sightings of it, at, you know, in the Oval Office. Uh, so <laughs> those kind of stuff, that's yeah. fun. Um, and, uh, um, you know, and you met us, him it, on an airplane once when, yeah, when yeah, he was still yeah. a senator, right? And you exactly. drew a picture? You drew, you drew a well, picture? My, of my, so, my, so what happened was I had um, seen him on a, we, this was before, before when he was a senator. And I had heard that, you know, they were ordering cases to his office. So I came up and introduced myself and he's like, oh yeah, I love it. I've been, I drink it all the time. And then my son, um, my oldest son, had drawn a while on the plane, drew a picture of him and brought it up to to, uh, Obama, and and, uh, he made a great, you know, autograph saying, "I've never looked so good," and uh, "Dream big dreams." And so that was that was a fun interaction. And then over time, once Obama became president, I had occasion, a few different occasions, to be over at the White House, and he would he kept saying, "I got I've got my honesty here," and he'd you know show me it. <laughs> That's funny. great. He's yeah. got his own picture on a on a special edition, right? <laughs> you know, that's, yeah, that that's incredible. Yeah, what a story and about the people that cross your paths. Yeah, when you're really putting yourself out there and you're putting your right. passion, your mission out there. It makes sense that it, that it attracts people, and yeah. they don't necessarily know. And if it's the president, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, we had other, you know, fun um, singers and actors and actresses who really just, you know, made it a staple of their diet. I remember one time, it was Madonna or Springsteen were going to Australia and they're like, they got to have their honest tea there. How do we get it? And we've had to figure that out. And, you know, it was um, what working fun. out the logistics. Yeah. Wow. Well, let's, um, let, let's move ahead a little bit into uh, in your experience as, as executive chairman of Beyond Meat. 
And as we, as we, well, I thought it'd be interesting to I guess, explore a little bit around, you don't have to be a vegetarian to enjoy yeah, beyond meat. For sure. Uh, but my understanding is you and your family are vegetarians. Is that right? And, and well, when did that, you make yeah. the decision and how did yeah. you make that, make that call? Yeah, it's a funny story. So uh, we have three sons and uh, when our oldest son turned 10, he became vegetarian and uh, we were sort of watching it. We didn't, my wife and I didn't join him, but he actually convinced his two younger brothers, partially because he was a bit older and stronger, that they should try to be vegetarian. <laughs> they may have done it as self-preservation. It anybody, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but the more he talked about it, it was clear it was something he was passionate about. And and he made a lot of, you know, I'd say good arguments. And and when he was 13, he had his bar mitzvah and he um his portion Torah portion that he had presented in uh, as part of his remarks was all about the kosher preparation of meat. And there's a passage in the Old Testament about how you have to clean out the blood from the animal. You, you shouldn't eat the blood because the blood is the life. And he's like, well, if you, if you don't want to eat the life, don't kill the animal. And, uh, and, and then he said, if you can meet your dietary and nutritional needs without killing animals, why wouldn't you try to do that? And so my wife, and I, you know, I'd say initially out of sympathy, he said, well, we'll, we'll try being vegetarian. And for him, that was a you know, wonderful gift mm-hmm. from us or gesture. Uh, and we were always, since then, have always been happy with the decision from an ethical perspective. But I'd say the first five, six years was tough from a culinary perspective. We were just frequently disappointed with the taste of these, you know, veggie burgers um, and other products that were clearly inferior. They were, they were a consolation prize. We weren't eating the things that other people got to enjoy. Hmm. And so um, in 2012, my wife read this article about this company getting started out in the West Coast, um, getting launching in retail that was trying to replicate the taste and texture of meat using only plants. And, yes. and she said at the time, boy, if this company succeeds, that would be wonderful. And I, you know, I sent an email to info at beyondmeat.com and said, hey, if there's any way I can help out, you know, this really sounds interesting. And I've got some experiences, you know, that, that are rel- I think are relevant. And mm-hmm. um, they did need help. They were they were doing less than a million dollars in sales at the time and really. Did um, that email go right to Ethan Brown? <laughs> yeah, it did, it did. <laughs> he was answering the I, info. When <laughs> yeah, email. for sure. For sure. It was a small company. Wow. And uh, yeah. And so. I uh, got to meet him and and uh, got involved as a board member. And then what happened was we got into a regular pattern of weekly calls. And then we said, you know, um, there's enough happening. Let's make these every other day calls <laughs> where I could just sort of check in and advise him. And and then, you know, that was, um, I was really enjoying that work. And and as my um, role at Honest Tea was transitioning away as we, you know, because we had sold the business, but I was still there. I worked out a, a really wonderful arrangement between, uh, Coca-Cola and Beyond Meat, where I can work half time for each business, and that allowed me mm. to help Honest Tea scale and you know keep its mission on track as it grew, and with Beyond Meat, help it scale, help it grow, uh, and to ex- expand internationally, to raise the money to grow, and then eventually to take it public. and And so, um, really wow. enjoyed my connections. Well, I really enjoyed both roles, but with Beyond Meat, I transitioned earlier this year from executive chairman now just to chairman, which is not a manager management role it's more of a okay. governance role but it's still very engaged and, and excited about the business and so um it's been so fun to see this business grow and once again another mission oriented business trying to connect people's diets and health hmm. uh, and sustainability well we have definitely enjoyed beyond burgers at our house and we and did over the weekend and oh, i was good. telling my wife in my <laughs> research but before this interview i was listening to you do an interview talking about how important the sound of the meat in the <laughs> skillet, the sizzle, the, the smell, sizzle all was, of it. yeah, and how that was missing. And I'm like, you know what? Because we had veggie burgers, you know, years too before. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it was more about like the microwave or maybe oh, the pan. Goodness. And or if now you put it in the grill, it would, you know, dry it would out just and implode on the grill yeah. or something or just stick to yeah. it. And it's a completely, yeah. she's like, you know what? Yeah, this, that is a big difference. It oh, actually it is. Yeah. So for our family, I, where I didn't end is, so for our family, our, you know, we, we, we not only we become stayed as vegetarians since the uh, mm-hmm. first 15 years, but we actually just this year um, moved over to become vegan, um, oh. which is an, how, an extra how, step. How has that gone? You know, it's funny. It is a big step. It is, it's, it's as big a step as going from, you know, omnivore to vegetarian. Um, so you really do have to make changes. We we did like eggs and cheese and butter, 
Um, but I will say physically, I feel actually much um, even better than I did. So, you know, like, for example, those two workouts I did this morning, I don't think I, you know, that would have been hard to do. Uh, and wow, so no being kidding. able to, you know, All recover right. and, and bounce back, um, I just feel like I have a lot more. Um, my recovery times are, are faster and, and uh, sort of overall just body suppleness and, and um, uh, flexibility is really. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. that sounds like a great payoff for the effort yeah. to, to making that conversion. You, yeah. you had mentioned uh, going back to the business side of, of that conversation, the success about Beyond Burger and the IPO that you guys did was, I mean, the numbers I wrote down, you went from 1.5 billion to 13 billion in three months. Right. You're talking on about the, market market cap. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and and the I think I guess what I read is one of the most successful IPOs in the last twenty years or something along those lines. Well, it was really gratifying to feel like um, we were helping show that mission driven business and in particular plant based foods are not a niche. You know what it really was about showing yeah. this is we're hitting the mainstream and. And and as we did the roadshow leading up to the IPO, we met with tons of investment houses, and and uh, these are folks that have just own, haven't had a chance to invest in this kind of business, this this kind of approach to business. And so mm-hmm. we saw their um, receptivity to the idea. And so for us, it was gratifying. What we what I've heard since then from tons of food companies is we've helped pave the way for other mission driven businesses and other food, you know, healthy food or sustainable food businesses to think about the public markets as a way yeah. to raise capital. And, and we've also heard that, um, you know, for a lot of families, whether it's individuals that, that, you know, they appreciate the chance to invest in something they get to believe in versus, you know, sort of uh, investing in something because they think it's going to make money. Uh, and, you know, um, ha- there aren't many companies like this in the public market. And, and so that was a positive uh, and gratifying experience. Yeah. You've been over. So it's been a, you sort of pie, well, I guess you pioneered tea, <laughs> organic <laughs> tea, and now meat alternative, uh, meat substitutes, meat alternatives, uh, and you're opening up categories that way. I mean, it's well, you know, that your intent? Mind, all of these, well, all of these things I'm doing with other people. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm glad to be a part of it, but I'm, you know, when, when I did it on this tea, I co-founders and partners at Beyond Meat. Obviously, Ethan is the founder and CEO, and you know, be able to help and support him and. Mm-hmm. And now we've got two new enterprises we've launched here. Uh, we're, we're also with great partners. We have a yeah. A talk, a, talk about that. Yeah. 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 So we have a restaurant Eat called Plant Plant Burger, uh, mm-hmm. which is a uh, it's out now six outlets here in the um, DMV, the the Mid Atlantic, um, and uh, really wonderful to see these plant based burger restaurants getting such a, a wonderful response and and growing. And of course, any any restaurant that's growing during this time during this pandemic is got to have some unusual aspects to it. And so for us, that's, you know, it's great to see we can, we can be growing during this yes. challenging period. And then um, I also worked with Chef Spike Mendelson. We're launching a new brand called Eat the Change. Uh, and that's going to hit the markets early next year, early January of 2021. Uh, and so we're, we're developing now the products that um, are part of that portfolio. And once again, uh, no surprise if you know, <laughs> you know my playbook. So it's going to be, you know, planet friendly, uh, mission-driven yeah. business. Uh, we're finding foods that um, we're really emphasizing biodiversity. So we're we're bringing to market foods that aren't maybe part of it. what I've. Well, here's one interesting statistic we found as we started looking at different ingredients. There were six crops that represent over 57 percent of all agricultural production. Hmm. I said, "Wow, that's pretty." We can call a monoculture. That's really so. Let's 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 build a food business that uses none of those crops. No, no corn, no 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 sugar, mm-hmm. no wheat, uh, no soy, no potatoes. Let's just, just you know avoid those crops, and and um, it's forced us to be more creative, and also uh, allowed us to really come up with some wonderful recipes. Are these recipes and products secret, or do you we give us a snapshot? Yet. We haven't announced okay, it yet. All right. but they're going to be you know um, what we're calling them. They're all nutrient dense. We call it chef crafted, chef and planet based. So they're, you know, we're taking into account, they'll obviously be organic, uh, emphasizing biodiversity. We're going to use only recyclable packaging. Uh, and this is the approach okay. that we're taking. Wow. 
I can't wait to see what that's going to be. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fun. We're, <laughs> it's, it, it, You're going to rock you know, the like boat I again, I think. Yeah, it's fun because I'm, I'm get you know, so the muscle memory, I get back into the uh, entrepreneurial mindset. And so, you know, some of the same challenges of involved in building a business. I, I'd like to ask a few questions in our remaining time about you as a leader running your company, yeah. um, things of that nature. Um, so what's one trait that you wish you can instill in every employee and why do you think it's important? Mm, well, <laughs> you know, one thing that's just critical is optimism. You have to, you have to bring that because you, every, every, um, every day you're presented with challenging situations and you can sort of say, Oh, this is, this is, <laughs> this is it. I can't, this is, this kills us. Or you say, all right, we got to find a way around it. You know, so that resilience, if this optimism and resilience, you have to be able to have the setbacks. I mean, you can't, it's unrealistic to say, well, I just wish there were no setbacks. They're, they're going to be there. And so how do you bounce back from them? How do you find a way around them? How do you, you know, it, what is it? Uh, get knocked down nine times, you know, get up 10, you know, <laughs> you've got one be, extra time. Are there, yeah. are there, are there any specific mantras or routines or any any training that you use for yourself well again that to remind yourself to get up and do it that physical activity is just a great way Mm. to be able to renew the energy you know i I, i've said this before but people say well your most valuable resource is your time i actually disagree with that i think your most valuable resource is your energy Uh, Uh, because if you have a negative energy if you don't have the right energy it permeates an organization and people see it you walk in the door and if you're like oh (laughs) <laughs> or you know then that's that's the that's what you spread versus you come in and it's positive and you and you just um can can convey appreciation to people um that's what that's what spreads so i think that you got to you got to protect and and develop that energy at all at all times i love it i love it so um it, it's a little bit of a leading question. Tell me if you don't want to talk about it, but what's your advice to business leaders on delegation? I've read some of your thoughts on delegation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to explore that with you because yeah. as a, as a founder, you've, you've had to grow through that multiple times, right? Where right. you're doing right. everything, you're the expert yeah. and now you've got a hundred people working for you at honest tea and you've got what? $86 million and revenue that you're driving or, or oh, I can't exactly. remember exactly, but oh, we were over, yeah, for, we were doing over 150 million at honesty, you know, when I left, but, um, yeah, it was, it was this, the readers <laughs> can't see it, but there's a really yeah. cool chart in the back of mission, a bottle that shows the amount of people he had working at honesty and the growth of revenue anyway. So yeah. really yeah. once it, once it hit and it started growing, yeah. It was not a one man man. About for anyone. sure, for sure. And it, but it's a real gift to be able to start up a, a company and handle every aspect of the business because then you never um, get and, and never get too distant from it. So it means when you hire the people to take over those roles, you still want to stay connected to that work. Hmm. And, and um, obviously, having done it with Honesty and then been so close to it with Beyond Meat and now doing it again with Eat the Change, it just means that. Um, I, I, <laughs> I can always jump into a situation and, and I, someone doesn't have to say to me, okay, well, you know, our, our cost of goods is composed of these and things. I know those cost of goods, you know, and I know, I know the cost. <laughs> I negotiated of, them. I know. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, <laughs> so, um, you know, that's a really important, uh, skill and discipline. I think any entrepreneur needs to have, um, don't, and I, and I, I try to instill that in my team. I, I say none, no one on this team is just a marketing person or just a finance person. Mm. When we have a meeting, I want you, if you don't like, you know, a color and a label, <laughs> at the very least, you should be asking about it. Even if you're the finance person, why is this thing purple? You know, why is, uh, how can we say this? Because you have a perspective that, you know, maybe it's a fresh perspective on an issue and, and you know, that our consumer might ask. So we should, we should make sure everyone at the table is a, is a full entrepreneur, not, not just performing these niche roles. And so empowerment is yeah. really about, you know, delegating the and once you hire those folks once you hire your team out you've got to empower them i mean you you obviously want to give guidance and you want to correct course correct if you think something's wrong uh and you want to be able to share be transparent about all the information but then you've got to empower them they, i've always felt the I, I believe in entrepreneurship i believe everybody can be an entrepreneur and so you just got to give them the power and 
the, 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 the authority to make those decisions and, and try to pro- support them as best you can. How do you handle it when one of those people that you've invested a lot of time and energy in, you've empowered, you know, they really know your business and they are, they're, they resign or yeah. uh, there needs to be a change. Yeah. How do you well, approach that? Yeah, we haven't had as many folks resign, but there, we've certainly had situations where people, you know, we've had to make a change. And so, um, you know, I think the key is, is if you are giving people all the information they need to do their job and you're giving them the right feedback, it shouldn't be a surprise uh, if they get fired. You know, one of, one of the things mm-hmm. we've talked about it at, at Honesty and Beyond Meat, no one should be surprised at the end of the year about their bonus. They should know what bonus they're going to get to the penny because they've managed the business and they know the results. They know what they're held accountable for and they know the information. And so mm. I, I will say in the beginning with honesty, it was, it was not as uh, effective as it is as it, as it got later. And certainly as it's, as it's been in the subsequent businesses where, you know, um, as long as you're, as long as people understand the goals, they understand, yeah. the, uh, you know, what information is, is, is used to evaluate the performance and they're given the tools to address them. Then, um, you know, I've certainly had to terminate people over the years, but I would say uh, after the first three years, like I said, there's some challenging situations, but after that, there was never a surprise. Like, what do you mean? I, I being fired, like they know. And if you're managing their performance well enough, um, usually they'll sort of recognize, you know, beforehand, Hey, I, I probably need to move on because I'm not doing what you need me to do. You, you've talked about before about making, helping managers feel like entrepreneurs, and you used the word empowerment before. Yeah. Uh, how, what, what strategies or tips yeah. do you have for people who like, Hey, I'm managing a team of people here. What in the world yeah. are you talking about? Make it. And, and then we, we work in a company of 50,000 employees. Yeah. What are you talking about? Making them feel like entrepreneurs? Well, and just to, to adjust what you said a little bit, because I don't, I'm not just to having about having managers be entrepreneurs. I want frontline employees to feel like entrepreneurs as well. So, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, as an example, at Honest Tea, we would have an area manager, somebody who would be responsible just for, call it just for Manhattan or just for um, Brooklyn. And that person had a goal and had a budget and got to see his or her results uh, every, really every day. And um, they had the power to say, okay, I'm going to spend a little more on this marketing promotion. And we'd say, well, you can do that, but it's part of your budget. And you know what your budget goal is. And, and like I say, so they have, the, they have the information, they have the power, and they have the tools. And as long as they get the information, you know, they were, they, there was an entrepreneurial situation. And, and we could obviously recognize and celebrate their success and, and uh, hopefully manage um, for improvements if we didn't see success. But like I say, I, um, nobody, uh, I, I, I'd like to think maybe <laughs> maybe someone could correct me, but I'd like to think we didn't. Nobody was um, terminated with by surprise, and no one was promoted by surprise. Everybody sort of understood. <laughs> oh, I like know? that. Yeah. That's the ideal situation where where employees know where they stand. Yeah, because they're going to feel better about that because they know the way that it's. It may not lead to stability, but it makes them feel like, hey, I, I understand the course that's being charted, and I can live that's within right. that. Yeah, so that's it, it. you know, gives them that comfort. What, yeah. what do you, what recommendations or have you had where an employee has an idea and they, and they want to communicate that idea to the C-suite? Um, how can they do that effectively? Yeah. Well, ideally, um, you have a, a, a frequent communications in the, inside the company. So both at Honesty and Beyond Meat, you know, um, Beyond Meat a little now, it's harder that it's a public company, but we would always have weekly calls. Here's, we're just talking and here's, here's sort of updates on the company. Here's what's happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, and during, at every time, at the end of every sort of update, there's questions and the questions can come from anybody. There's certainly not a, managers only get to ask questions. Um, so we encourage that. And then, you know, obviously within teams, um, we have that same communications each team has its discussions and mm-hmm. so people get to ask questions are they are they if someone has an idea to improve something like you mentioned earlier on the packaging and like someone in finance doesn't like the packaging yeah what they how, how do they go about communicating that do they just speak their idea is there a yeah, certain way they should package idea. it yeah it's always it's always best and, and certainly people know if they bring me a problem it's um, no one should be afraid to bring me a problem. 
But it's even better if you bring me a problem and a solution <laughs> or, or ding, an ding, idea. Ding. That makes yeah. sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you can bring me a problem, bring me a problem and a solution. Yes. Okay. Well, yeah, there's nothing wrong. If you don't have a solution, that's fine too. Like if you're just like, hey, we're getting terrible feedback from our consumers around a new taste profile. All right. Let, we, need, we need to hear that. Don't, don't ever hide a problem. But, um, you know, if you say, hey, I don't like this package or I don't like this color, what do you, what would you like? You know, and and so um, you don't want to be a naysayer uh, without sort of also having ideas to bring forth. Okay. Just a couple more questions here, Seth. Uh, What what books, letters, or magazines or or websites would you recommend for someone who has their their sites set on the C-suite? Yeah. Well, um, so... Certainly, um, I do think, you know, that entrepreneurial mindset is really important, even even in larger corporations, in the way <laughs> things are changing today in America or business, it's mm-hmm. all moving. It's kind of the whole deck has been um, wiped and clean and we got to start again. And so you've got to be able to think in an entrepreneurial way. So I do think not just mission to bottle, but, you know, entrepreneurial stories um, will be continue to be relevant, even in large companies. So. Um, I, I, uh, I do like, uh, how I built this. I think that's a wonderful, um, oh, series. Guy of, Roz, you know, right? Yeah. I got Roz yeah. and, and, uh, did you read the, the new book yet or the he has a podcast? Yet, no. I think the yeah. book just came out in the recently. Or, yeah. Or soon. Yeah. And, and I, I, I was one of his early, uh, interviews. So, um, oh, cool. I think it's just great to hear yeah. those entrepreneurial stories, stories of resilience, stories of creativity and problem solving. Um, and so you want to just sort of hear what those people go through. I, um, I, because I'm in the food industry, I do read lots of different, um, newsletters just around what companies are up to, especially around new products. I love to see what new ideas are coming to market. There's, there's always an idea when you see new products, it's kind of like, um, little T, you know, just sort of like artwork. You get to say, all right, there's something, something in here that's worth paying attention to either bad, good, you know, whether it's, hey, I don't think that artwork, that label works, or, oh, that's an interesting new ingredient, or that's an interesting way to talk about um, function of a product. And so hmm. um, always looking at new products on the market, what they're doing and, and how they're emerging. I like that. So things that books and magazines that are, or publications that really foster an entrepreneurial mindset. Yeah. No matter if you're a big company, small company, to keep your creativity Super yeah, charged. and the good thing about food, so uh, it, you obviously don't have to be in the food industry to, to to view these things. The good thing about food is everybody can relate to it. So I'll admit I don't read as much about new software that's coming out. It just doesn't. And and look, I use software, but I'm not a, I'm not a, um, I don't re- I don't have as much of an understanding of it. So if I were to read all about new software products, I don't think they would capture my imagination as much as a new food product. I think anybody can look at that and say, oh, okay, well, what would that taste like? Um, so, mm. you know, I think that's well, one of the wonderful things about food. Everybody is a consumer of it. When, um, what's a tool or gadget that's contributed to your success that people could go check out? Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm actually not super tech by design. I was okay. like a late, late adopter of the cell phone. Um, <laughs> no, I had was, a back phone I, a long time. I've been, yeah. Sure. <laughs> well, it, it was good because, um, it helped me, especially when I was raising uh, my family, it helped me stay present. You know, mm-hmm. I, I see parents now with their kids and the kids, you know, doing something and the, the parent is, you know, scrolling through emails like, oh man, you don't know how <laughs> precious this time is. Get off the it's phone. It's fleeting. And, yes. Yeah, focus on your kid. Um, so mm-hmm. really for, for um, my, you know, certainly in the first 10 years of honesty, I think I probably, which was 1998 through 2008 probably didn't get a phone until like 2006 or something like that. So that's relatively wow. late in the game. Yeah. Um, but those were also critical years for where our kids were growing up. And I was, I was present. Um, it probably allowed you to keep some boundary, easier to keep boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. So I know, think my, my secret gadget is um, being present, <laughs> wow. staying off of the phone when, when I have the chance to be with uh, my family. Yeah. And you don't have to purchase that. And maybe, Maybe that's you. You have to purchase less stuff, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> which yeah. will help you be present. Yeah. Uh, so Seth, is there anything that I didn't ask today uh, that that you'd like to share? Well, you know, just that we're re- at a really interesting moment, right? I mean, this this um, society has been disrupted so um, dramatically. Um, our food system, our health mm-hmm. system, our even the way we 
sort of um, get along as a population. And and it's it's a fragile moment, I think, for our economy and and really even for our democracy. And I think that um, without sounding like you want to be um, exploiting an opportunity, I think there is a business opportunity here to to help make things better. And so I really encourage and and and, and hope entrepreneurs can step up. And and so, you know, this brand we're we're um, launching called Eat the Change. It's not accidental. This is about how do we help people shift their diets to a better place? You know, we need it. We need that to happen. Um, and, and, you know, you can go to the root cause of the pandemic, which was about our relationship between animals and, and, and uh, our health and, you know, which set mm-hmm. us off. So that clearly that needed to change, but you can also look at some of the stories around the meat industry and how um, dangerous some of the health impacts that were for the work people involved in, in the work there. And I think that also highlights the need to change. So, um, I do think um, there's a lot of opportunity here and, and important work that's needed to be done. And um, a great word to keep in mind is the uh, the Chinese characters for crisis are um, it's comp- comp- composed of two elements. One is the word danger and the other one is opportunity. And yes, there's a lot of danger at this moment, health danger, economic danger, but there's also a lot of opportunity. And how do we, how do you balance those? How do you make sure you know, and I'm not, by opportunity, I don't mean selling hand sanitizer at, you know, $30 a gallon. I'm talking about really more, more long-term thinking about how do we help make shifts in the way we interact and consume with the planet and with each other. Yeah. When you look through it through that lens, the word that you said earlier, the one trait that you'd like to instill in every employee is optimism. Right. And when, right. when you have a mindset of optimism, uh, or op- opportunity, looking for the opportunity, even yeah. in a pandemic. Right. It, I sense it, it lifts your spirits about possibility. You're waking up earlier, <laughs> you're doing more research, you're reaching out to people. You're, the one thing you're not doing is hunkering down. <laughs> yeah. 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 You're, you're involved out in the world. Right. Um, right. That's a very powerful message, I think, to, to finish up on. Thanks for your time today, Seth. Sure. Yeah. Great to be with you, Ben. Ben Fanning is a number one best-selling author, Inc. Magazine columnist, and CEO of the Fanning Group, an international consultancy and corporate training company. To learn how they can help your organization, go to benfanning.com.